from the center of the universe and the home of your Grey Cup champion, Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos post-game reaction podcast brought to you by Something in the Water Brewing. JB, it felt pretty good regardless of what the game looked like. I gotta say, it felt pretty Pretty good to be back in a press box watching a real football game, not a scrimmage. Uh, you can ag- at least agree on that before we get into the horrible things that may or may not have happened yeah, during no, the game. It was, it was good. I mean, it wasn't wasn't the world's best game today, but it was certainly better than a scrimmage for sure. So we'll get into all the details of the game. We've got some injury news as well. We're going to hear from Coach Dinwiddie from his post-game comments. And we'll kind of give you our general takeaways, offense, defense, special teams. I thought there was a lot of information that we could get out of this game. And before we get into all that, I want to tell you a little bit about something in the water brewing, our title sponsor. I, I've got a, a really nice amber on the go here. This is this is called uh, Half Moon Pond. Um, I'm an amber fan, and this this one is fantastic. And for all of our listeners... We're working on something that is going to give you um, maybe a, a sneak peek at uh, the, the beer that we're most excited about, Longboat Pale Ale, the Argos-themed beer, the beer that was created for fans of the Double Blue, the beer that was created after a chance encounter with Argos right guard Darius Bladek. We're going to have some exciting news about that beer coming up shortly because we're only weeks away from its release. And if you're an Argos fan, this is a must-have for you all summer long, Longboat Pale Ale. So all sorts of good stuff coming up that we're going to talk to you about with something in the water brewing over the next couple of weeks. But yeah, right now, I'm just, uh, this is is the perfect, JB, this is the perfect post-game beer for me, an amber. I think that it felt like an amber kind of day for me. So... (laughs) Let's uh, let's get into let's get into what we saw out there today. Let's start off with the fact that we thought Chad Kelly was going to be out there. He was number one on the depth chart. We expected him to at least play a few series, and we didn't see him at all. And we didn't know at the time the reason for that. But as you'll hear from Coach Dimwitty in a little bit, it turns out that Chad Kelly had some soreness in his throwing elbow. Pre-game. So again, he dressed, he got ready, planned to play, got out there for pre-game warm-up. There's a little bit of tightness and they decided that it's not worth the risk. They're just going to sit him. And so he, while he was expected to play those first two series, he sat and Ben Holmes came in instead and started the game. Is there reason to be concerned? Like you were there with me post-game talking to Coach Dinwiddie. Are you, are you worried right now? Like it's throwing elbow, right? Like his throwing elbow with some tightness. He didn't seem that concerned to me, but I feel like I'm a little bit more worried than Coach Dinwiddie was. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm concerned. Uh, Chad hasn't thrown the the number of reps that a starting quarterback has thrown in a long time. And anytime the quarterback's elbow is a bit wonky, uh, it, it definitely concerns me any more than if a pitcher had tightness in their elbow, I would be concerned. So... Uh, coach team's okay with it, and I took that to be, I took that to be a good sign. I'm not sure if he would want to, to scare people. I would say if Chad does not play preseason game number two, then we could start moving, uh, moving up the DefCon, uh, the DefCon situation. Yeah, and Shinetti asked him post game about whether or not he felt Chad would play in the game coming up this Thursday, the the game in Guelph at Alumni Stadium, and uh, he was sort of non committal on it. But he said, you know, he expects him to be, to be out there, and if they need to decrease his workload, they'll do that. But um, yeah, he does. He really didn't seem that worried. It's one of those things where I feel like if this was a regular season game, he, he probably plays. So that's the vibe I got anyway. And they're like, look, it's preseason. It's only two series. Let's just just sit. Let's take care of it and uh, and get it looked at and reevaluate this thing tomorrow. So, so anyway, we ended up we ended up with no Chad Kelly. Um, ben Holmes uh, started, and while I thought Ben Holmes did some really nice stuff in the blue and white scrimmage this past week, it just wasn't his day today. He's he's got a good arm. We know he's capable of of being a good quarterback. He's got talent, but he just wasn't seeing it today. And and we saw that almost from the opening drive, and that led to a 
pretty scary situation with Curly Gittens Jr. getting hurt. Was that the very first series? I feel like that was maybe it was the second series of the game where... Um, yeah, the second uh, series. Yeah, and Holmes just didn't see the coverage and he led Gittens Jr. into a, a huge hit. What was your reaction when you saw Gittens Jr. go down? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I was really frustrated. I, you know... I, I I didn't see the need to have the starting receivers in if the starting quarterback wasn't in. Um, you can you can run into problems there. So I was, I guess I was a little. I know it's frustrating to to sit the the receivers, but to me it's no different than you wouldn't put the starting quarterback behind the second offensive line. I think starters roll with starters and and twos roll with twos. So I. I probably would have sat uh, their number one paid wide receiver unless Chad was throwing to him. And I, I actually thought when it first happened, I thought he might have broken his arm. It looked like that kind of hit. Yeah, well, it looked like helmet on arm for sure. It looked like you could have had, and you know, um, that they might have broken the forearm there or, or, or dislocated the elbow. But uh, fortunately, it seems not to be something to worry about. Dinwiddie didn't want to commit to anything because they haven't had enough time to really look at it but but he did say he felt like Gittins Jr. probably could have gone back in the game but they obviously decided that at that point let's just uh you know count our blessings that that he's he's okay and not send him back in that would I would have been (laughs) I would have been pretty frustrated if they'd send him back in the game I think and I've had a few questions about what exactly happened on that play um, I, I don't know exactly. We didn't have access to a replay on that. They didn't show us anything. What it looked like for me is that Hamilton was playing a sort of trap coverage. And I had some questions on Twitter about what that was. So essentially what's happening on that play is you've got the corner is baiting the quarterback to throw an outbreaking route. So the corner on that play is acting like he's trailing the outside receiver. It's a concept you see a lot in football, a lot, especially in the CFL, where the outside receiver has a go route, and then either the number two or the number three has an outbreaking route. It's it's a it's a really simple concept you see a lot. And where you can get into trouble is on this trap coverage, or sometimes called Kathy coverage, gold coverage. Um, that cornerback acts like he's trailing that go route and so the out should be wide open but then halfway through the route he suddenly peels off and turns in toward that outbreaking receiver and that seems to be what happened on this play and Gins Jr. had that out route Holmes didn't see the corner in that trap coverage misread it and led him into uh, what ended up being a pretty big hit so yeah, yeah, fortunately it worked out, I think. But well, yeah, scary. Well, yeah, well, because what happens? The reason it catches quarterbacks off off guard so much is it it isn't you know it's it's a variation on the cover two with the outside corner having having the flat coverage. But the difference is is that the number two receiver, usually the outbreaking receiver, has a man on him, and so from a quarterback read. It looks like maybe it's it's man two or potentially cover four because normally in cover two, there wouldn't be somebody covering that out. That out, you would have the corner who's playing flat. So you you just don't look for it because basically it's like double coverage. You you think you have somebody, you think you have the the man coverage going with the out, and then the corner peels off and um, catches you completely unaware. It is a tremendously uh, effective. Uh, defense because it, you just are not looking for that corner to peel off for all it looks like it looks like it looks like cover four it looks like man two it it does not look like that cornerback is going to peel off their their deep receiver it's it's a really you know i i can't really blame the quarterback because you see quarterbacks fall into it but uh you can see how dangerous it is because you absolutely lead your receiver you're leading them away from their <laughs> coverage you know, the man who is defending them. So you think you're doing a good job, but you're actually leading them right into traffic. Yeah, and it's it's the aptly named trap because it is exactly that. And we started seeing this more and more. It was about like five or six years ago, you started seeing it a lot suddenly in the NFL. And it was it was really causing trouble because like you're saying, it's that, that first read that you're making as a quarterback. As soon as you drop back, the key that you're looking for, you're watching that corner and he's bailing. And so you're thinking, okay, I've got this. And of course you don't. And it's, it's set up for... It's set up for you to fail. So anyway, uh, the Argos got away with one there because Gittins Jr. was, uh, or we think, is going to be okay. It sounds like he 
he's going to be okay. He certainly looked like he was he was doing all right uh, post game. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed that that uh, turns out to be nothing. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him not playing uh, this Thursday in Guelph, just because when you I think sometimes when you have a scare like that as a coach, I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of guys actually sitting after getting a little bit of action on this on this night. But we'll see. We'll see what what Coach Dimwini does with that. Um, in terms of Ben Holmes play, I, I was expecting more from him and and he played uh, he played quite a few snaps. He, you know, he had that that first, um, you know, that that first run. He was out there with most of the starters. He had the starting offensive line with him. He had Devaris Daniels out there with him and and Gittins Jr. for a few plays uh, and Ambles and everything else. He ended up throwing a pick on a ball that I just I don't know. I don't know what happened there. He just seemed to lose it. It sailed way over Ambles' head. The read was right. Ambles was open, but. It just took off on him. Do you think this is a thing where it's nerves, where you know he's got this opportunity, or he wasn't prepared to go in right away, and that threw him off? Like, what did you read from what looked like a sort of uncharacteristic performance from Holmes? Yeah, I wondered that a little bit. Maybe that that threw him off. That he he didn't expect to play at least the first couple. You know, you think you know you think basically you're going to ease in, and then suddenly you know you think you're going to be the third presenter and suddenly you're the first presenter and uh, it totally throws your rhythm off. I think, I think a little bit of that is, is in the mix for sure, but also he was playing against ones. And uh, when you play against ones, the game goes much faster and he's, he is still a work in progress as a backup quarterback. So I, I do think partially what you saw there was, not being able to read the field uh, as effectively as he needs to against a, a number one defense moving around. And he just, he, you know, he he's trying to rocket balls in because he's not necessarily sure what he's seeing. And when you try and rocket a ball in, that's when uh, you can get balls that go high. You know, it happened to McLeod. Uh, certainly much more in, earlier in his career when, you know, he tries to put a little extra heat on it. And if he doesn't step into it, that's when the ball you know overthrows the receiver so i i do think it's a bit of that i I give him a break that he wasn't expecting to be the starting quarterback right from the get-go and also it's a work in progress uh being able to to play against starters in the cfl and he he was not he was not ready for that today i'm glad you brought up mcleod because that's what it actually reminded me of they're they're very different quarterbacks but it was reminiscent of early McLeod Bethel Thompson, his first couple of seasons, whenever he'd get in, you're just like, what, what's going on here? And obviously we saw McLeod turned into a fantastic quarterback, but uh, yeah, that's, that's why you, you can't, you can't give up on Ben Holmes based on, on this performance tonight. He didn't play well. He was, he was the worst of the three quarterbacks that the Argos had out there tonight. I don't think anyone would tell you any differently. However, uh, it's, yeah. you know, it's one bad day. He also had the best. I mean, it was also the best competition that he was going against. I, you know, I would I would take that second half with a big old cube of salt. Yeah, no, I think that's there's something to be said for that. And let's talk about that first unit defense that was out on the field. They did give up a, a touchdown drive. Um, they gave a touchdown drive to Bo Levi Mitchell. They they held him in check for the first drive. Bo was out there for two series. First drive went really well when they really had most of their starters in there. And then they started to roll some guys in and Bo was able to really put a nice drive together. But I want to talk about that first unit that we only saw a, a few plays from. It was pretty cool to see uh, Remolade out there. And, and again, you see that that first step that you've got from the outside. Uh, I, I thought we saw some really nice play from uh, from Benoit Marion as well. Brinkman was cool to see. Hendricks, like those that that D line, even without Oakman and without some of the other guys, we were missing a bunch of linebackers today. There was no there was no Enoch Mwamba or Winton McManus, but they did some cool stuff in a short period of time, and I really didn't think we would see that. We saw something that I teased, I think, a few weeks ago after I'd first seen the Argos in training camp, they had Jordan Williams in at linebacker playing the max spot. And they disguised coverage such that it ended up being covered two. And Jordan Williams from the Mac position actually ended up taking a deep boundary. And that's something I've seen them do in practice before. 
But to see them do that in a game, especially in a game against Hamilton, where you know you're going to see that you're going to play them 17 times this year, it was it was strange for them to kind of let that out of the bag. But but I guess it's something that quarterbacks are going to have to think about because it's a pretty scary. That's the the great thing about Jordan Williams, and this is where I think we're going to end up seeing uh, Muamba. McManus and Williams on the field is you can do cool stuff like that. He's totally comfortable in space playing back there because of the because of what he was asked to do at East Carolina. He's done that kind of thing before and see him roaming about there. You know, receivers are not comfortable running posts and corners and seam routes when they know that this hard hitting middle linebacker is waiting back there in cover two. So I love seeing stuff like that. Although you got to be surprised that we saw anything creative at all today, right? Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I. I don't know if. I, I think it's okay. I don't know how much they're gonna do that in the regular season. It never it seems to me to be like a fun thing you do at practice. I'm not entirely sure how effective it is having your linebacker 40 yards away from the line of scrimmage. Um, and you know, from a defensive point of view, to not have McManus, to not have Mwamba, to not have um, you know, CN Power uh, on the line. I mean. You know, I, today was was fine, and and, that, and that's interesting. But honestly, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I'm totally into into that cover two thing. That seems to be more like putting something in people's minds that maybe they'll look for. But I would. I don't know how much we'll see that. We got another sandwich bet coming, I think, because I I bet you we see that in yeah. the opener. I bet you see that coverage because I think they're going to do the three linebacker package. I think, and we haven't we haven't seen that yet. I just think that it seems so obvious to me based on what we saw a couple of years ago with Dexter McCoyle, who they used in a very similar sort of way. And he's a similar kind of player. Williams is bigger, but it's similar kind of skill set. And and they love doing that. And it, it was a nightmare for opposing quarterbacks, opposing receivers. And he's good at it. It's not, it's not the same as dropping Muamba into deep half like that i agree like what are you doing with your linebacker so far away from the line of scrimmage but they used it on second and 10 i think it was it was the right scenario for it i liked it i think i think it's just a a little wrinkle that is tough to read pre-snap there's no way pre-snap that bo levi mitchell thought that was going to result in a cover two coverage it just didn't didn't look like there was any way for it to happen except if you're counting on your middle linebacker to bail out like that so that's that's where I think it is kind it's of true. fun. It, it, it is a nice boundary side play too, actually. Right. Yeah, that's it. And that's that's how they used it. Yeah. So Mitchell ended up throwing a touchdown pass. Uh, pretty hard to blame Kwamu on this. He was the middle linebacker by this point, the second drive of the game. It was down uh, pretty close to the Argonauts end zone. Uh, what did you see on that play? We had we had a, a crossing pattern. Kwama backed out, didn't quite get there. Yeah, I, I mean, you probably circled that on the film. I, again, I'm. Uh, that's just a personal preference. I'm. I'm not. I'm not one for, for putting the linebackers deep and in space. You know, my. I. I sort of, default to linebackers stop the run and defensive backs stop the pass. So you know, he started to to drop back. He didn't drop back deep enough. There was a, a deep crosser that somebody handed off to nobody. Uh, I'm not crazy about zone in the red zone. We I saw think a lot it's of really that tonight. hard to. Uh, he yeah, has an understatement. I think it's really hard to communicate that. I think it it lends itself so easily to to overload zone busters. Like if they know you're in zone in the red zone, you I just think you're done. Like if you can you can if you can if you can go zone you in the red zone, you better make damn sure they think it's man. Um, if they know it's zone, I just think the the number of zone beaters you can throw in and the 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 margin of error is so small like you saw that touchdown no nobody had that nobody had that deep crosser so uh, i guess it works if the linebacker drops 25 yards and 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 picks that pass off but i wasn't i wasn't crazy about that but uh, you know preseason you know who knows what they're looking to do or what they're looking to hide or or what kind of film they want maybe you know they may very well may just be looking at Let's, let's play zone and whatever, and let's just see what happens. And then we've got film on drops, and we got film on pass offs, and and that's what we want. So, um, it, it was not a great play. Yeah, I I'm like you. I hate zone coverage when you get down close to the end zone. I just don't think it's so because I know like as an offense coordinator, I love seeing zone coverage down there. There's a reason for it. There's 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 voids for you to find. There's places for you to sit. You don't yeah. need that many yards. 
And so no, just, you you it is so important that it is disguised. Yeah, and and that wasn't happening. We saw that like they ran they ran they ran uh, cover three. Uh, cover three cut. I think they they ran from the fifteen yard line as well, um, and that got exploited. It, it's just like you. It's very hard to disguise cover three. It's it's yeah. like as man. It's really hard to sell cover three as man because at some point during the cadence, you're going to have to start bailing out. It's just and, and as soon as the quarterback sees anyone bailing out, they know. Okay, I've got someone. They may not even know what it is yet, but they know it's not it's not zero or one. So unless you're unless you're rolling coverage or sending some some heat, I just don't yeah, that, like that at all. I mean, any coordinator will tell you that covering that D. That's why Kansas City makes a living on it. That you know, Andy Reid knows that deep out. Uh, you know, that overrun is such a hard route to cover because it's almost impossible to stay in the pocket if you're playing man. And defensively, it's you know you're running through all of these different zones. So who picks you up? You know, does does the safety pick you up? Does the linebacker pick you up? You're between the safety. You know, it it really is um, it really is a tough play to defend. I don't. <laughs> I'm really glad I don't have to figure out how. And uh, another horrible thing happened on that drive, which was that Robert Priester went down. And we know a lot less about the status of his injury. It wasn't something that a lot of light was shed on post game. So it, I, I couldn't even tell for sure what we were looking at. It looked to me like we were talking about knee or ankle, but I, I don't even know which. Um, I had my binoculars trained on it and I just I couldn't see. And he has stepped up this camp as being probably the starting corner. Uh, to the boundary side and so if he's out for any kind of time that's going to be a pretty serious loss I, I don't know I don't know who the replacement is there because they brought in Quantas Stiggers as the replacement there he looked good and bad at times which you expect Quantas if you haven't heard us talk about him before is an amazing athlete it's really got everything that you'd want in a corner uh, from size to speed to instinct he, he's got everything but what he doesn't have is experience he never played college ball his only previous experience post high school was fan controlled football league he just turned 21 there's a lot for him there's still a lot for him to get down certainly technique wise uh, what did you make of of Quantas Stiggers out there because we saw him for a pretty extended run and we saw highs we saw lows yeah, yeah he looked, well he looked good I mean he had nice picks so like he went down the field got you know elevated got the ball as highest point um showed good hands uh, I thought that was impressive there was a there was a play where he wasn't great on on cleaning up the tackle um when he got pushed out of bounds he got into a fist fight I, and the referees I guess being an exhibition game didn't toss him but he would definitely have been tossed if this was a regular season game. So he has to be careful about, um, you know, getting into a fist fight on during the football game. But uh, what he showed, well, exactly what we thought is the raw potential, the raw talent. Clearly, the coaches love it and and are willing to put him out there and and see what he looks like in in game situations because I think they're really excited about what he can be, but. You'd love for him to not have to be a major player for for this season, to be honest. Uh, you'd love to him to be able to just learn all season um, and, and really be something and, and just kind of be a special teams ace. But you look at how quickly he was called in today. I, I don't think they see him as a practice squad player. I think they see him uh, being on the roster because, uh, like you say, they brought him in early. Yeah, well, he was the first um, be, man off the bench. It'd be interesting, you know, I thought they might have been more looking practice squad, but I, I don't think so. I think I think they see him being one of their uh, one of their DBs. Yeah, I thought I thought we'd actually see Caleb Holden there. I thought that made more sense. I know Quanta Stigard was, was listed as Priester's backup on the death chart, but when it was such an early injury, I thought, yeah, we'll probably see see Caleb Holden here. But no, yeah, they, they brought in Stiggers and... And he, he, like you said, he could be really good. What I, yep. what I did like to see was after that incident you talked about, his two negatives, right? We had the, the missed tackle, which was sort of like a body check, didn't wrap. Um, and then the play out of bounds where, did, was it his, his helmet got ripped off? Yeah, and I assume the other player uh, ripped it off. I'm, I'm not saying he didn't have a right to be angry, but, you know, you, you, you can't throw a punch in a football game. That's... That's as simple a rule as, as there ever has been in football. So, 
and it was on the far sideline when he got back to the bench Dinwiddie walked out onto the field to meet him on his way back and it could have gone one of two ways it wasn't the sort of screaming lecturing that you sometimes get. And I think Coach Dinwiddie played that the right way. I think that's an intelligent way to talk to a young player. Again, this is a player that hasn't had, you know, four years of college experience like a lot of these other guys have coming in. And so he sees that as a coaching moment. And so he pulls him aside. He doesn't scream at him or, or single him out in front of everybody. He just kind of walks him back to the bench and talks to him about you know, how you handle that situation, what you do and how some guys, especially knowing your situation, are going to try and get under your skin. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a yeah, exactly. It, it is a difficult it is a difficult thing to to coach because, you know, we talked about it with Edwards. Blue flame guys are rare. Blue flame guys make your entire defense better. How do you keep a blue flame from burning your entire operation to the ground? <laughs> that is the part where you get paid the big bucks but you know i think stiggers to me looks like that kind of guy he's going to be on the edge he's going to be physical it's going to be what it's going to be right he's not going to be a technician um but you you have to be able to kind of rein it in that was the fight they had with edwards for so long sometimes they won it sometimes they didn't and uh, it looks to me to be similar uh, which I'm all for. If if you can, if you can find a way to make the blue flame work, uh, it it adds a dimension to your defense that um, is is valuable. Let's talk about the other two quarterbacks we saw. So second in was Cameron Dukes, which surprised me. I thought we were going to see Brian Scott before we saw Dukes. I thought I thought Dukes was. Coming into the season, just having seen all of their film, having Duke, seen their... Dukes looked like Chad Kelly last year. A little bit. Um, there were moments like that, but I didn't expect too much out of him. I really didn't see... I, I'm not saying that I saw him as a camp arm coming into camp, but but I, whatever the next step from that, removed from that is. And and the blue and white scrimmage didn't really do much to uh, dissuade me of that, that, that view. And yet today, I, I thought... I thought Cameron Dukes was was really exciting, not conventional. Uh, what? Did, how did you see his his play today? <laughs> um, yeah, he, he was entertaining. He brought a spark to a team that was definitely flat. Like definitely a team that was not, I would say, excited to play this game. I I, I don't know what their week of preparation was heading into it, but it, it, it certainly didn't seem like a team that was ready had built. To play this game and he came in and fired up the team gave it some excitement uh you know making random underhand throws and moving outside of the schedule and and just passing it to random receivers who were sort of open kind of like a rugby player slash gunslinger slash um i'm not sure who else you would slash but you know it was very unconventional uh very unsustainable but entertaining and I think coach wasn't that harsh on him because, you know, I, I don't think they have big plans for him. But it for a, for an exhibition game, it was exactly what they needed. They needed a they needed somebody to go out there and kind of mix it up and just kind of play a little wild, and it worked. So I was, you know, I was I enjoyed it, but I don't I don't think that that is something we're going to see again in the future. Yeah, and I think I think what Coach liked about it is that it brought that spark, right? Like, they were down 17 nothing. Hamilton had a kick return touchdown. They had the Bo Levi Mitchell touchdown. They had the field goal. And so, given all that, they needed a spark coming out, and he provided that. Like, he was exciting. You can't, you can't argue no, with that. No, exactly. No, it, that underhand pass out of the end zone. Um, no, it was, it was great. And, you know, I, 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 love, I love that energy. And then look at... Uh, Chris Trebler took that all the way to the NFL. So, yeah, it, well, it, it it actually reminded me almost almost video game like like people like to like to reference Brett Favre when you see that kind of play, but it seemed more like a guy that is new at a video game and he pushed the wrong button and it still somehow worked anyway. It was just it was odd. I didn't know how to describe his play for most of it, but it was highly exciting. He shows what an incredible athlete he is too. To have the wherewithal to like while you're being tackled to like underhand like windmill it to an open receiver and and he did that a couple of times. He had a jumping shovel pass, which I I don't know yeah, if I've ever seen I, that. 
I mean, I think what Coach and this, a lot of the team reacted to is just this kind of feeling of, let's go win this damn game. Like, what are we doing here? Everything's going in slow motion. Everybody's going through the motions. And he came out and, and you know, was playing, like, high school ball. Like, let's go out and win this damn game. And it was contagious and at least made the second half respectable. I, I don't know how hard Hamilton played in that second half, um, except for maybe a, a slightly – uncalled for a sack in the third quarter which we can talk about so it's i i understand why toronto was able to come back i think hamilton really went into vanilla mode but um from a from a team energy perspective i guarantee you he he relieved the coach of a lot of his anger in that second half and his his style of play i like you saying i I don't think it's conducive to the coaching staff seeing him as the number two. I don't think they would do that, but I completely think that's the kind of thing you want in a third quarterback. A guy that we know can run some short yardage stuff. He's He's got good legs and you can bring him in to run some sort of gadget things. And there's there's certainly excitement with his play, yeah, like, but I think I'm it's not like sure. It, it's like a basketball analogy. Be a guy came off the bench and he hit five threes in a row and two of them were on one leg. <laughs> right. And it was entertaining and it changed the game, but is he going to come out and shoot 95% and hit 15 points again? Probably not. And then uh, the third quarterback of the night, uh, Brian Scott, I thought was probably the best uh, can, in terms of conventional quarterback play of the night. I don't, I don't really think you could argue that too much. I thought he looked really good. Um, he seemed to really have a connection with BJ Bird, who also had a big day. Yeah, I think if, fantastic yeah, like, day. If Lonnie Moore was sort of the it guy of the blue and white scrimmage, the double blue scrimmage, BJ Bird, I think, was the the it guy tonight. He was he was all over the place. He made some incredible catches. Gonna make it impossible to keep him on the practice squad. Yeah, that's the thing. Like BJ Bird's gotta make after after a night like that's that's how this works, right? After a night like this, if you're prepared to expose your players and their talent to the rest of the league then that means you've got a difficult decision to make because if yeah, you leave him on your practice sure. squad, he's gone. You look at the bottom of that wide receiver group, there, there's three or four really effective receivers who are going to, who are going to be fighting out uh, to, to be the, you know, the six, seven, eight receiver in that room. Yeah. I know. Like if Lonnie Moore can, can bring back what he had this past, was that Tuesday? The, the, the double blue game or Monday, Monday it was, um, if you can bring back that, and if BJ Bird can keep playing the way he's playing, uh, I I don't know. They've they've got some difficult questions, and and some of those difficult questions are going to be ratio related because it may limit how many Canadian receivers you can keep. And uh, like Dejan Brissett was quiet today, but he had maybe the catch of the night on a two point conversion, and that's the second time in a row we've seen him we saw this at the double blue scrimmage too where he had a two-point conversion catch and again he seems to be like what is it with him where he seems to be so much more comfortable around the end zone than in the middle of the field yeah i i mean i would i would uh consider having him part of the red zone package he clearly has great hands i know he as a receiver he hasn't really fulfilled his potential they run the occasional jet with him i'm not He's okay at Jed. He he doesn't seem to have the quick t- quick twitch speed that you would want from a, a Jet receiver. Um, he, he's fast. He gets up to speed. He's okay at Jet, but he in the red zone he has great hands. He's able to catch it in a phone booth. I would definitely consider moving him into into red zone packages if 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 they've dressed him. Yeah, he just seems to, he's great in the clutch. Brissett has always been great in the clutch. Going back to that, was that Thanksgiving uh, game day in, in 2021, where uh, that ended with the Boris BD kick, that long field goal, that was all set up by a ridiculous diving clutch catch on third down to to move the chains and get them into range. And that was Brissett. And like, he delivers on that kind of thing. Like when the game's on the line, he's a great guy to have. But yeah, something about being close to the end zone seems to bring out the best in him. So they got to find a way to do that. But I thought a lot of it, like Unger, I thought I had a pretty good day today. Neil was a bit a bit quiet. But yeah, they're going to have some tough, obviously Gittins Jr. is your, is your star Canadian receiver. But beyond that, there's going to be some tough decisions to make. And when Americans like B.J. Bird are 
really making a case for themselves for being on the active roster. Um, it's only making that decision more difficult. The uh, the other guys I want to highlight before we get into a couple of special teams things. Um, so uh, actually, let's let's just spend a, a, another few seconds on on Brian Scott because we haven't talked enough about him. How much do you think it hurts him that it was late in the game where he came in? Because he again he looked he looked great. His first drive, he goes three for three. He he has the touchdown. And then he follows that up with uh, the two point conversion. He had some beautiful throws. He was playing smart football. He checked down a bunch of times because that was the correct thing to do. Does it? How much does it matter that those weren't against uh, Hamilton's best? I, I think it does. Uh, I I don't think you can not read into the fact that he was the third quarterback uh, onto the field, and whether they just you know don't feel like his ceiling is as high as the other players. I would assume maybe that's the thinking. Uh, higher, you know, higher floor, lower ceiling uh, dynamic. He, he he did look good. He did move the team, but I really do think in that fourth quarter, Hamilton was just looking to get off the field without giving up anything else. They got a nice lead. They were going to win at home. Um, they really didn't want to tip their hand to anything offensively or defensively. Essentially, the team just kind of put it into into neutral from where I could see for the third and fourth quarter. Um, I wasn't, I know we talked, I just mentioned briefly, I was not happy with the, the delayed sack on, uh, on Scott. I thought that was pretty Bush in a, in a exhibition game where you're just trying to get out healthy. And I know we disagreed on that, but you know, that is, that's not, that's not the kind of play you should be pulling in an exhibition game against backup, uh, offensive linemen. That's, you know, you're, there has to be a code or a brotherhood that, you're in this exhibition game to play hard and play tough, but you're in it to get out healthy. And what what they were trying to achieve with a delayed sack where they blew up Scott, uh, I can't imagine other than trying to be jerks. But the Argos also had that as well. Like they they sent Caleb Holden on a halfback blitz. Yeah, uh, late not in the game. not uh, not earlier in the game. Still more ones and twos in, and not kill. That was a kill shot blitz. Like absolutely, that was a delayed blitz where you're looking to catch uh, um, an inferior uh, tackle asleep, and it's like a 15 yard run, and they smoked him. I, I just thought uh, it was a, it was a, I thought it was a pretty bush call. He got hit pretty hard. I thought, uh, see, I'm okay with it, and this is the reason I'm okay with it. I think. You're legitimately trying to evaluate players at that point. You've got players on the field that are on the bubble. You're not sure if they've got what it takes and are worth keeping around. Like those weren't starters we're talking about at this point. Those weren't guys fighting yeah, for starting what, roles. What are but, you evaluating? Like, can can my you know can my safety beat this left tackle who's never going to play football? Like, come on. Well, I think what you're evaluating is you're seeing like these are guys that are, is this a guy worth keeping around? Maybe on the practice squad, maybe as a backup. But what, what what's is, a delayed what's blitz proven, look like? What's proven by beating that left tackle who's like ninth on the Argos depth chart? Well, what's proven is that he's able to disguise that delayed blitz pretty well. Oh, and maybe against, that's... right against somebody who's never going to play a significant minutes in the CFL. That's what I'm saying to you. It's just what you're not proving anything. It's like okay, you beat the ninth guy on the Argos depth chart. Congratulations. Like, but that's, counter that to that, not if he had sniffed it out, then what you would show right there is, okay, this guy doesn't quite get it yet. He doesn't have that sense of time. Like you knew it was going to be one way or the other. <sighs> Either he gives it away or he doesn't. Not, and Not hard to beat. Not hard to beat. All right. I mean, we don't need to argue, but. it's I, That's okay. No, I like, like, I like the There's a reason the, the left that, tackle, there's a reason that line is, is, you know, they're not the starting line. It's hard enough to find starting offensive linemen. I mean, they're just. It's you know it's it's a bush play because what what is achieved here like you blow him up because you know what are you what what is it that you're hoping to achieve to to win this game you're not trying to win the game you're trying to get out of the game healthy no, you're evaluating players no and it's 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 tough to evaluate players if all you're running is a base coverage and you're not you don't send any heat you don't disguise any coverage you're just out there you know, running, running like, you know, Pro Bowl football, like that's not a way to evaluate talent. You know, it's so. not Pro Bowl football. There's pro, look, there's, there's, there's tough football. And then they're sending a delayed blitz against your third version of the offensive line. Yeah. You know, I don't there's think, a I reason don't... no starter would stand behind that line. 
I don't because think we're that line see would not be able one. to that line would not be able to protect a starter. You would never put a starter behind that line. Everybody knows if you're into your third offensive line, that line is not going to be able to protect. You know, and and coaches know that, and the defensive coordinator knew it, and just thought it'd be funny to light Scott on fire, and, and they did. <laughs> He was he wasn't doing it for humor. I'm telling I you, like just, if you if you talk to more. if you talk to to Steinauer about that and like what what the Hamilton plan yeah, was I'd there. Yeah, I'd say what what well, I'd love to have asked him that. What were you trying to prove with that play? I think you would say we're trying to evaluate our defensive players. Right, and I would say that's a BS answer. <laughs> but that's... trying to evaluate your safety's ability to beat the ninth best offensive lineman on the Argos that'll be useful. It's not a starting safety. It's not like a delicate was out there being sent against. Who, who, against you're not backups. achieving anything. All right, we're, we will not agree on this. Um, no, let's let's talk about something that we do. Who was agree the left on. tackle at the time? I don't even know who. Right, was in exactly. At that point. They're never going to play. Everybody knows that, anyways. So a guy we do agree on, um, Deontay McMahon is a pretty interesting running back. I have no idea what to do with because this team is stacked at the running back position. We know we got. We know what we've got in 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 Harris. In yeah, he looked great. AJ Olette, Adam Boboye, Leak, and yet De- Deontay McMahon, the fifth running back on this team, made a real case for himself. Every time he touched the ball tonight, he got between seven and nine yards when there was nothing. That same offensive line that you were just talking about is the same offensive line that was out there blocking for Deontay McMahon late in the game. And he just found space somehow in there. And that's why he's been one of the most exciting guys to watch at Argos practice. What do you do with him? Like, what's the answer there? Is this is Leak's well, job in jeopardy? I, if, if it's me, I mean, I think, um, well, I guess you have two choices. I mean, number one is you don't play him at all next week and you hope you can sneak him onto the practice squad. Uh, number two, you don't think you can sneak him on. You put him in with the starters and you see what he can do against a real defensive line and real linebackers. And you get a better sense of, can he do this? He he did not, unfortunately, look natural as a receiver in uh, kick return, uh, which is too bad. So I, you could probably continue to work on that. But that those are definitely the two choices for me is, is bury him or put him with the ones and see if you have something or see if you just had a guy who was, who was gaining yards against an inferior, um, you know, and that, yeah, like a second, a second level defensive team that wasn't running anything scheme wise. They were just, they're just playing head up ball and it, he was able to get yards. So, you know, I know that you have a good nickname for him, which is exciting, but uh, I think. What we, did I call him? I, I'm, I'm very curious to see what they do next week with him. What was my nickname for him? I can't remember now. Uh, I believe you called him the special man. <laughs> yes, yes, McMahon, the special man. Yeah, it was the um, worst nickname. Yeah, I've that's ever the heard. worst nickname ever. I that can't stick. The special man. No, it, um, it, well, it I was will trying not. to think of a nickname on the fly while we were talking yeah, about him. I, but, I'm curious. I agree. He did look good. He did look shifty. Um, maybe it's too late to hide him, and let's you know roll him with the ones. Let him get some time with the let, and and see if you can get a little thunder and lightning going. But but that's the problem though is that you can't. I don't know if he can replace Leak when Leak's clearly the best kick returner, punt returner on the team, and they they threw McMahon back there to see if, if he could compete. But we you know whether it's been in practice or the or the scrimmage or this game, he just doesn't look nearly as comfortable back there as Leak does, and he's just not as good at at returning returning kicks and punts as as Leak is. And so no, I I, I again I think it's a crowded. That's, when we get into our debate over who's going to make the roster, he is, he's a difficult, that is going to be a difficult cut because he will sign with Montreal Alouettes. <laughs> he's, he's really good. Like, yeah. like yeah, I, If I, we I, don't keep him, we're definitely playing him in the East. Ottawa, Montreal, um, he will he will sign with one of those two teams. Yeah, I think Ottawa, like Montreal, like I think they love Walter Fletcher and Stanbex, obviously their guy. But yeah, I could see I could see a number of teams actually rolling the dice with um, with McMahon. Man, he's he is he is a special man. Uh, he's... <laughs> the stop. Stop. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's transition to specials. Talking about specials. We had a couple of things today that I thought were interesting. So the first one uh, is the kickoff return unit. So. They sent out their Leak and Adarius Pickett as the two <laughs> they returners. Sure did. 
this went this went badly but i want to kind of explain <laughs> what the line of thinking was for this so last year in montreal adarius pickett was sort of the off returner and the primary returner they had uh, chandler worthy back there we know all about chandler worthy and how good he looked you don't typically kick to the off man and to to illustrate this like uh, Mario Villamazar, uh, Argonaut, uh, who was last year a BC Lion, also played that same spot for the BC Lions, the off returner. And they just don't get a lot of balls to return because it's it's disadvantageous to kick it to the guy to the wide side of the field. It just doesn't make any sense uh, from a, a kicking standpoint. You're kicking away from your strength. You're kicking um, into more danger. And so you almost always, even though you, you don't want Chandler worthy handling the football, you kick it to him because he's standing in the place that's far better for you to kick to strategically. And so the Argos line leak and pick it up deep. They've got pick it to the offside and Hamilton chose to kick it to pick it every single time he was out there. And Pickett got uh, one good return that he that he had that was really well blocked. He got blown up another time. Another time it went off his hands and at the end zone he got blown up again. I think Hamilton was only kicking it to Pickett. I hate how that rhymes. It makes it sound like I'm doing it on purpose. They were only kicking it to him for two reasons. One, so that Toronto could not properly evaluate Leak and their kickoff return team. Two, because they were really happy to be able to take full speed shots at Toronto's starting cover linebacker. And their their point of view is if you're going to put one of your most valuable defensive players back there on kick return, then we are going to kick it to him every time and force him to go into contact. So uh, that that may be a problem because the, the, the unfortunate thing is he's really good at that job. When, when the other guy gets the ball, like we saw it last year, when Worthy got the ball, Pickett was a great lead blocker for him. And we've seen that in, in practice reps too with Leak. When he gets the ball, Pickett's got great instincts for getting upfield and finding the guy to hit. So what do you do? Is he too valuable to keep on that team if teams are just going to keep kicking it to, to Pickett instead of to Leak? <laughs> uh, they definitely were not expecting it. Um, the film is out there now. Will, will other teams continue to do that? Well, based on today, I would say yes. He, yeah. You know, he, Pickett, Pickett is not a returner. It puts, I think it puts too much stress on him to to use a skill set that is that is not elite. To to kick return is difficult. Um, to me, he got chased out of that job today, and they're going to have to come up with either a new way of disguising his role, or they're just going to have to abandon it because I think when when you have a special team plan that gets exposed on film, it, it's over. The other option to that is you create return plays specifically designed for him. Like he's he's a great athlete. Yeah, I mean, I don't. But he, you know, he's. I don't know. I, I think that's a lot to ask of him. I don't it think is. he is a kick returner. I think he he's okay, but that's not why he's back there. Right. And so I I don't know. They'd have to see it in practice. I'm, I'm not sure that makes sense to basically make him a full-time kick returner. And the last special teams thing I want to talk to you about is uh, Hegarty's punting. So Hegarty had a great sort of net punting or rather uh, punting stats. Uh, net didn't work out as well. He punted one for 58 yards that got returned to the house. He punted another one for 58 yards that had a big return come back. He punted one for 53 that went out of bounds at the four was fantastic. But I think the best punt of the night for him was his 44 yarder. The one that goes 44 yards, lands, and everybody is in this perfect umbrella around the returner. Uh, how, where's, where's the line for, for you? Like from a special teams coaching point of view, obviously you can't have him kicking 58 yarders on a rope. <laughs> That's no good. Like where's the balance? Yeah, he had a, he had a great day. He was booming. He was booming punts most of the day. Uh, I, I think you just need, it just needs to be a little more directional on the the kick return touchdown. Like like you said, it looked like he outkicked the coverage, and it was in the middle of the field. And when you outkick the coverage and you don't have any directional leverage, it is pretty easy for an elite returner to to pick a lane and go. Uh, he I think he just needs to work on his directional. 
And if you can if he can pound it like that and have some directional leverage, then I think that's that's a weapon. I, I think that's just all it all it's going to take. What do you think of the rugby style punt? Uh, like I, you know, like being a being a, a global guy, an Australian guy, maybe he has that. And then we saw Hamilton run that, and it yeah. caused some problems for Toronto. I, I like it as a look occasionally, but I'm not I'm not entirely sure there's a returner I fear that much currently. I'd have to it would have to develop over the season if there was really a returner. I feared in the sense that they could they could destroy you, but. You know, the kick return touchdown was bad. Even if you have kick coverage, you shouldn't give up a touchdown. But uh, I like the way he kicked it. I don't, I don't think any – if your punter is 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 hitting it above 50 consistently, I think that's a pretty good – that's a pretty good situation. And, and, you know, you just tweak. I think you tweak a little. I was I was happy with, with how well he hit the ball today. Why don't we listen to Coach Dinwiddie's uh, press conference uh, post game, and we'll just have a quick reflection on that uh, after we come back. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up and, and get you set for what's coming up this week. So this was Coach Dinwiddie uh, post-game outside the Argos locker room. Yeah, I think there was some good individual play. I didn't think we played collectively as a team. That's really what you, you look at. Now, some of these guys individually played well. That, you know, they're p- making a statement to make this football club. So I thought there was some bad football, but I thought there were some good things we can, we can learn from. And, and uh, we showed some guys can uh, you know, make plays at this level. Uh, it was on the quarterback, uh, both of those picks. So, uh, you know, Ben's just got to be better and, and continue with his reads and trust the process of it. So he kind of, he you know, we didn't see the, the coverage, what it was, and, you know, m- missed the throw. So uh, we'll, we'll look at it. I don't like to make too many judgments until we look at the film. But, yeah, he, he uh, had a tough day. I haven't got a chance to get there yet, so I got to sit down with the medical staff. I think they'll, they'll, be, they'll be okay, not long-term injuries. Uh, Curly probably could, could have battled through and got back in there, and I just didn't want to you know, risk it for the first piece of the game to, to lose it for a big chunk of the season or something. Yeah, no question, no question. I, I, I didn't think we had any energy, and then Cam came out in the second half and got, brought us to life. So, uh, yeah, him and Brian did some good things. We'll look at the film, and you know, hopefully next week they can you know continue to grow and put a better performance out. Yeah, so we were planning on playing him two series. He came out, and he had some you know, uh, soreness in his elbow, a little tightness. He could have went, and he wanted to go. I just said, hey, Chad, we're going to shut you down. We'll get you going next week. So wanted to get him out there, uh, get a flow for the game, but at the same time, it allowed us to evaluate other guys. So we're good with Chad. We feel he's going to be a good quarterback here. He's, you know, he's continuing to grow. And right now, the only thing I'm really, really losing sleep at is uh, finding out who our number two is. I think he should be good to go. We'll, we'll limit some of his throwing if it's still bothering him. He you know, might have just he woke up, you know, and it was sore today, and then tomorrow it's fine. So we, we had the docs look as nothing serious. So uh, it was more precaution than anything. And on, his throw, on his throwing elbow. Yeah, throwing elbow. Yeah, yeah. So it was just tight. He said, hey, my elbow's tight. And I said, hey, listen, let's, let's move forward and we'll go next week. Coach, on Cameron Dukes, how much do you want to pull back? Because, you know, on that one drive, we saw a jump shovel pass, an underhand pass. It's exciting. How much did your heart stop during that drive? Yeah, well, I thought there were some other throws. You know, it, it, the one thing it shows he can create plays. He's got a little, little moxie to him. I think you know you, you have your your guidelines of what our offense is, and each quarterback you know kind of has their own flavor to it. So, you know, as long as he's not being careless with it, um, you know, he's being creative, and I, I think he's got the chance to you know uh, make some plays, and he's got to got to continue to grow. But I think you know you can see. If, <laughs> it's not there. He can scramble, get guys to suck down. We find those second windows throw. So he's pretty creative with that. Well, I think it's definitely a good thing that the game didn't end at half when it was 17 nothing, <laughs> And then we walk into that post-game presser with, with Coach Dinwiddie. He was, he was not like... I can only imagine what he was like at halftime in the locker room. I like I don't know. I haven't heard. I can only imagine there were words flying out of him. Rage. He looked like a, like a some sort of anger meme. Uh, and yet post game, he was he was pretty chill. I thought. Yeah, he seemed like a a guy who who was happy with the bounce back, even though. There are lots of caveats to that second half. You know, did Hamilton really try? Um, twos and threes against twos and threes. Nonetheless, it was a good fight back from the team. They did get back into the game. Looked like it was going to be exactly my predicted score, and then they messed that up too. Um, so I, I felt like Coach was happy with the punch back and felt like maybe he had... There's only so many times you can get angry at your team in a row, and then you you have to kind of change it up and 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 be a little bit more rebuilding as they head into the next exhibition game. So that that's what it felt like to me. The coach was had been upset, said his bit, 
no need to continue to be angry. Let's let's move on and, and try and be positive about but what we saw here and and let's be serious about preparation heading into uh the Guelph game. In some ways, this was the best thing that could have happened to the Toronto Argonauts. We were talking about that when it was 17-0, because the starters look terrible and you know they're gonna sit through film tomorrow. And there's nothing they're going to be able to say. They look bad. They didn't look prepared. And, you know, from what we gather, it wasn't the best week of practice this week. Um, they, uh, they they showed that when they got on the field um, today. They Sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need a reminder that you can't just walk through this thing. And so to me, I think, you know, seeing a response like that in the second half and seeing how poorly the starters played, knowing what kind of veteran leadership there is in that locker room, I think the Argos are actually in a really good spot. In some ways, this was the best thing that could have happened today. Yeah, I, I think so. The It's hard to fire up, especially if you won the championship. And it's, it, The reason repeating as champions is so hard is because when you've been to the mountain and you know what it took, it is not easy to fire that engine up again. It's been the same in every sport, you know, for for 50 years. So to think that the, you know, I felt going in that the Hamilton would win today pretty convincingly because it meant more to them than it did to Toronto. And Toronto is, is you know, not interested in, in a preseason game in, in, in Hamilton. They're, they're looking at the championship. Um, but you do have to not take that for granted. You can't wait too long to kick that into gear. So I think it will give coaches uh, something to talk about that you can't just go out there and 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 turn it on because teams are gunning for you and teams will will bury you. If this is a regular season game, it, it could have gotten ugly if Hamilton keeps their foot on the on the gas the whole game. So they they avoided something that was embarrassing because the bench fought back, but that was not a good first half of football. We've got a lot of things coming up this week. So in preparation for the last preseason game uh, for the Toronto Argonauts, which is in Guelph at Alumni Stadium this Thursday night at 7 o'clock, we're going to have, well, first of all, make sure you go to xsandargos.com. Uh, check out uh, JB's report card uh, evaluating uh, every positional group's play from this evening's performance. We will have your pregame walkthrough podcast coming to you late Tuesday night to get you set for that Thursday game. And then, of course, of course, our, our postgame reaction podcast following their game against the Red Blacks Thursday night in Guelph. All that and more coming up this week. It is, it's going to be a busy one, JB. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm, I, I couldn't be more excited that football is back. Well, that will just about do it for us on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast brought to you by Something in the Water Brewing. For JB, this is Ben Grant saying so long and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see you.